I never shy away from, you know, talking about things that need to be talked about in hunting industry habitat. Um, you know, for example, I don't like people being taken advantage of the hard earned dollars in the hunting industry because this XYZ product is going to shoot you a big buck and it's just another fad. So we try to point those out and uh, purely it's not to create controversy. It's just this is the experience and I want to do my best to help you out. And when it comes to deer habitat, there's a lot of discussion about invasive control. In fact, government programs spend millions of dollars to help remove invasives that often don't work but largely a high percentage of time uh, displace wildlife populations destroy wildlife populations i'm not saying it's all bad uh, i really had my eyes opened uh, there's a great comment and if that person was watching this i hope you comment again i tried saving your comment it was a very long one and, and part of what he said and we'll talk about you know what is an invasive um, but he said you know yesterday's invasive is today's and is today's native plant uh, non-invasive and He's, he talked about a lot, and what I'm seeing this a trend in uh, CRP or managed force law in Wisconsin. I had an administrator the other day. It was a woman that's been in it for a long time. She talked about uh, in, the, in her 60s that uh, it's almost impossible to correct or remove in a 40-acre parcel to look at it more in spots and areas that you want to uh, change, and you have the ability to change because of the size and just create pockets. And that's, that's what we talk about. It's been a focus of mine and a strategy that I talked about and developed a long time ago of creating pockets within these invasives. And But this person, this individual had years of government experience uh, removing and, and being a part of those millions of dollars spent to remove invasives. And he just said it was a big waste of time. He said that they remove invasives on this 40 acre parcel. They work decades to do so. As soon as the land ownership changes, it goes right back to whatever was there because they didn't remove it on the neighbors. It's something that's a losing battle. And he said that's interesting, kind of like echoed those thoughts of um, that woman um, habitat specialist with the state that uh, great to do it. You know, you have five acres. You want to try to control it within those two or three acres of habitat that you have. That's awesome. But always remember the next person that comes along is probably not going to have the same love and passion for removing honeysuckle or autumn olive, whatever it might be. And so, but he wrote a big thing in there talking about how it was just a lot of wasted dollars, a lot of millions of dollars wasted. And it's, a, it's the incorrect focus for deer habitat, wildlife habitat in general, because there's a lot of other priorities to be done, a lot of lower holes in the bucket that need to be addressed first. Um, and often this ends up becoming a waste of time. I've seen it firsthand with writing an article. It was an old QDMA article, Quality Whitetails, where the editor made me remove a portion about autumn olive on how to control it, how to manage it, how to use it for your part of your plan as far as uh, four different bedding groups that I came up with, with browse and briars, brush, uh, and then regen, hardwood regen, conifer, and shrubs, using those four groups and then if autumn olive in Michigan, there's a lot of properties there that if they didn't have the autumn olive, they wouldn't have any wildlife cover. And there's nothing that they're going to find as a replacement because deer eat it all. So it's, it's a really hard process. But I want to point out some things before we get much further. Brown trout. This, this applies to wildlife species or wildlife habitat. Do you know that brown trout were introduced into the United States in 1884? Dylan looked it up. And he's the one that brought this up to me. But this is a non-native, highly desired trout that we have right now that displaces other species but it's it's a native now considered it's it's just part of what we have people don't look at it as an invasive let's look at it that way um, like they would something else did you realize pheasants came from china pheasants literally came from china in 1881 so the pheasants that are highly sought after are good indicator species of quality wildlife habitat is actually a non-native invasive did you know that norway spruce you know why they call it norway because it's not from the United States. There's no city or state, Norway, where it came from in the United States. It's actually from Northern and Eastern Europe. And it was introduced in the late 1700s, 1700s sometime. But you know what's different with Norway spruce? Let's talk about that compared to autumn olive or honeysuckle. Norway spruce will continue to spread in through a field. It's a full canopy, shades out everything else, actually changes the temperature, the thermal, properties within that wood lot complete shade nothing else can grow underneath it so it completely displaces everything you take an autumn olive which is a non-native uh, shrub and it'll grow it grows into pretty thick thickets but it's an early successional growth habitat and eventually be overtaken by hardwoods once it gets shade out completely it dies it might take a few years but it dies uh, red cedar red cedar is considered an invasive in some areas but it's native and so a red cedar they have red cedar removal um, 
uh, programs down in, uh, in uh, Missouri. So they'll go in and remove these red cedars on your property and then they'll plant hardwoods and trees in its place. The difference between Norway, the biggest difference in an autumn olive, the autumn olive is actually probably better for the habitat. You can make a case. Uh, it's certainly better for wildlife overall. Norway is a timber production tree. So it gets money back to the state, money back to the feds, and it's looked at as a highly desirable tree. It's a marketable timber, and so that's the main difference. Folks, that's really what it is, the main difference. We need to get away from some of these large scientific bodies saying that every invasive is bad, remove them completely. That's not the way it works. Look at pheasants. I know people that are on one hand, they're, treat, they're preaching not to plant miscanthus grass, which is a, a non-native species, even though it doesn't spread, there's no history of it spreading. I think the first uh, miscanthus grass planting, um, I'm not big on them because I don't think they need to be used as much as they are, but miscanthus grass is a viable tool in the habitat manager's toolbox. And I first saw it uh, right around 2008. And, uh, and so since that time, I've had about 14, 15 years of experience with it now and seasons and seeing it all over the place. It doesn't spread at all, but it's a non-native. But someone will speak that that's bad, but then at the same time, they spend decades planting pheasant habitat or habitat for pheasants, which is literally from China and introduced into our country in a non-native species. And you can make the one, the case one is worse than the other, but by definition, it's a, it's a non-native. So... I think there's a lot of hip hypocrisy in the scientific community, a lot of it based on either timber value or this is a cool wildlife species to have, and we're okay with that. And this is a shrub. It's just for wildlife, so there's no monetary value for that as far as timbered production, so that's bad. So there's a lot of hypocrisy. So you really need to look at some of these groups and, and wonder where their, their goals are. And I think sometimes they just they just hold on to because of what they learned in school that this is non-native, so it's bad. So that doesn't really, no thought, no common sense applied, no common sense management, just non-native, this is bad. Period. And then they push that on to other people, and the scientific community often does that with these types of things. And now, you know, then you have this argument back and forth, which is good, which is bad. Look for balance, that's what you find. You want a lifetime of fun? Buy 40 acres, try to remove honeysuckle or buckthorn. That's even worse. Automouth, just keep removing it. Number three, does wildlife matter? Again, I go back to the 10 acre field, five acres, whatever it was in Michigan, where they removed a whole field of automouth. It was full of wildlife, full of deer, full of rabbits, songbirds, nesting birds, maybe in some grouse. Could have been some early successional growth next to an adjacent ag field, might even had some pheasant. Bottom line is they removed it all put tree tubes and then the person's given a, an award for doing so for the state. Look how, look what they did to this 10 acres. You had all that wildlife got hit on the nearby road, killed, there's no other cover. So displacing songbirds, wildlife species, small game. And that was a good thing because we put tree tubes of hardwoods in there that were literally dead five years later because they got knocked over in the tubes, eaten, run over. And now the landowner five, hour, five years later has nothing but an empty field and they were given an award for it. I'm not saying they should go to jail. But they should be fined. They shouldn't be given an award. That's just ridiculous. That's horrible. Wildlife matters. And someone will say, I had a question on uh, YouTube the other day in a comment. And the commenter was, I have an autumn olive thicket. And you could say I have a whatever thicket, red cedar, honeysuckle, whatever it might be. I have an autumn olive thicket and it's full of wildlife. I want to slowly replace it with something else and still keep the wildlife. Not gonna happen. Now what you can do is plant a few species around it, get those to grow, completely cage them, take the cages down, then work a little bit more, a little bit more, and in 50 years, you know that lifetime, you might have removed it. But bottom line is if you do it all in one year, like most of the programs make you do, or most people do, you're gonna displace that wildlife. You're gonna have that wildlife you love. So you buy the land for wildlife or to take care of invasives? Think about that. Wildlife matters. To me, it matters even more. You know, I'd rather see songbirds, small game, whitetails have that good population because the pipe dream is we're going to remove those invasives and we're going to replace it right away with something else and keep that wildlife and grow it. It rarely, rarely happens to spend people spend a lifetime to do it. Now, if you could do it, it was something that could be done within a couple of years, three years, four years. You know, the average landowner owns their land for about five years. Not even close of enough time to put a dent in it and still retain the wildlife value. But maybe you do it over 30 years. Let's say it could happen in three or four years. 
I had to be a little bit more of a viable goal, you know, an adequate goal, an appropriate goal. That because you can actually look at it and say, you know, in three years we'll have this, four years you have that, but that's not the way it works, folks, unfortunately. Pocket cutting. This is what I see, crop administrator in southern Michigan. It's a federal uh, plan. Being lenient, saying, telling the landowner, hey, this is the only pocket of real diversity you have that's holding wildlife. Don't get rid of it. That's what's holding your rabbits right now, a little bit of pheasant cover. Because if they take that, which happened to be autumn olive there, not going to have it. Or telling my client recently in southwest Wisconsin here, the woman, uh, biologist, forester, whatever she was, telling the individual that honeysuckle is the only quality portion of property on your property where it's actually holding wildlife. If you remove that, you're going to destroy that wildlife potential. Don't do it. It's only a small portion, one, two acres. I'm not saying it can't get out of control, but the point is I really like pocket cutting. You know, in Missouri, take 20 acres, remove all the red cedar, plant hardwood tubes. I've seen it. And then those hardwoods don't grow or they're not there. But bottom line is they're open timber in a few years. They don't provide any wildlife value for the landowner. And they're, they have a wildlife plan. It's supposed to be for wildlife. So you take that 40 acres instead. Cut out pockets. Five acres, seven acre, whatever. Pockets throughout that. Leave 40, 50% of the red cedar. Take pockets out of the rest. Plant something else. Spot spray for red cedar when it comes in. Now you have true diversity and you have a base cover in the form of red cedar, no different than switchgrass. Norway spruce, you know, non-native in Norway spruce. Now you have that base of cover that allows you to have wildlife because once you take that cover out, you have nothing for the wildlife and it's going to take years and it's going to pass the lifespan of those wildlife species. And it's going to take decades sometimes to, I think a lot of those fields end up, the hardwoods don't grow, maybe they do. A lot of times they don't grow and it turns into early successional growth and 25 years later you have good habitat, you know, four landowners later. You got to think about that. Pocket cuttings, outstanding tool. Take the red cedar out in pockets, burn it, harvest it, whatever you want to do. And then in that place, plant tree tubes of hardwoods, plant shrubs, plant grasses, plant pollinator blends, plant switchgrass. Diversify. Actually give yourself true diversity. Taking all the red cedar out, putting all hardwoods back in is not diversity. You're just putting hardwoods. And I don't care if it's a cherry, a maple, and an oak. It's still hardwood. It's kind of like grass is saying, well, I have a diverse CRP field because I have big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, switch grass. That's diversity. No, it's grass. Grass is grass. Conifer is conifer. Shrubs are shrubs. Big, big differences. Pocket cut. Think about that. You have your three or four acres of land. You want to take out the autumn olive honeysuckle that's growing on there. That's awesome. You know, it might be just what you love to do and you want to replace it with something else. But you have 40 acres and you're, you're going to spend a lifetime trying to move buckthorn and it doesn't come back. Then you're going to be really sadly mistaken when you end, end up having to sell that property. Maybe you die. You never get to see it sold. And that's a great thing. You know, it's it's it lives a lifetime with you. And someone's going to take that over and allow it to grow back. It's around here. It's around the neighbor's property. And... Again, it goes back to what this individual said before in the comments and wrote a beautiful comment on there that it's a, an act of futility and a lot of times you get nowhere. And you can go try it. You can go try removing invasives. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to do that, that there's a viable way to replace it and put something native in there that works out better. But a lot of these non-natives have really good wildlife properties like autumn olive. The reason autumn olive flourishes in Michigan is because deer don't eat it. So, and then it has berries for nesting birds, grouse. It's really good escape cover for rabbits and holding cover. And then of course for deer too. You can use it. You can pocket cut it. You can create trails through it. You can maintain it. You can keep it from spreading if you want to. You don't need to plant it. It's already there. I'm not encouraging you to plant something that's not already there if it's an invasive. Bottom line is you can manage it. You can make your land better having it. And that's where you have to learn to control and use it. And that's where value comes in. Writing an article and not even mentioning it because it's something that is on the list to destroy every time you see it is short-sighted at best. Probably the best word I can pick that's not as offensive. The bottom line is it's very short-sighted. And really not thinking about the whole big picture of including wildlife. How can you use this? How can, how can you control it? That's what people need to hear. And again, that goes back to, I don't shy away from controversial subjects because I just want to help you. Real world, you know, in the real world.
This isn't on paper. We destroy everything, replace it with this. And guess what? In 25 years, you're going to have great habitat. And they'll probably lie and say it's going to be five years. Bottom line is if you have this type of habitat, learn how to control it, learn how to use it to your benefit. If you can slowly replace it, fence, and add other, other shrubs, other habitat, that's great over time. But always aim for the long side. Be realistic with your expectations. Always think back to brown trout, pheasant, Norway spruce. Things that are actually introduced to this country that were invasives, non-native. And look at it, it, just Norway spruce is a great example. It just keeps taking over a field. Nothing else grows. And the thing is, it grows for 100 years or more. So this isn't something that, like autumn olive, that dies, gets older, and something takes over. Honeysuckle that can actually blend in sometimes and mix with other habitats. It is the habitat. And it's completely changed. Changes the soil. Changes the soil pH. Does a lot of bad things to the soil. So think about those in retrospect. Think about where money really guides a lot of this so that you can go into this season and make good decisions, informed decisions when you're being told to do something that, hey, just doesn't sound right. If it, if it feels kind of funny, uh, probably is. And uh, learn to use some balance and a little common sense. It'll go a long ways when it comes to invasives and deer and wildlife habitat. Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.